Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Sismini Trudor, and welcome to a beginner's guide to Fallout 76. Because, you see, yesterday's video was a bit of a quick tour of Fallout 76, kind of trying to show off as much as I could. But, since I've made that, I've had a chance to dig into things a little bit deeper, ask Bethesda some follow-up questions, have a good think about the game and how just all of it fits together. So, ahead of the beta, I thought I'd put together a quick guide to Fallout 76 for new players, which is, you know, everybody. So, let's dive in, shall we? So, you start off in Vault 76, obviously, and here's a pro tip to get you kicked off. Unlike pretty much every Fallout game ever, you do not need to spend the first two hours of play in the character creator fiddling with noses and chin length and what have you. Because for the first time in the Fallout game, you can now redo your character completely anytime you want. Just literally at any point in the game, you can change your character's face, body type, gender, everything. So you do not need to agonise over the character creation, which was particularly useful for me because I didn't really have time to. The Vault itself is one of the shortest and simplest in the entire Fallout franchise, so just head through the mostly linear path through it, grab basic supplies from the tables as you go, and head straight outside. The corpse just outside the door to the right will provide you with your first gun, another corpse just down the steps in front of the vault door will provide a machete for your first melee weapon, and down to the right you'll find an army truck with a handful of explosives. So you've got every weapon type available to you immediately, but do try and save the explosives in particular for bigger and more dangerous opponents. They would most definitely be wasted on anything you're going to be running into imminently. So, first big important note, for now you are totally safe from everybody. Until you hit level 5, you cannot be attacked by any other player and you can't attack them either. Difficulty in the opening section seems to be pitched fairly low as well, and if you're used to playing Fallout on hard, very hard, or survival, you'll have no difficulty whatsoever. So feel free to explore freely without worrying too much. That basic starting machete we just talked about should deal with pretty much everything in the immediate area. Now if you do want to level up quickly to get to level 5 and unlock PvP as an option, or just to unlock some new perk cards, the Mr. Handy just outside the vault will give you the first part of the main quest with tracking down the Overseer. Meanwhile if you run pretty much directly south of your starting location, that will bring you to the town of Flatwoods, where there are a handful of small easy quests that introduce basic food and drink mechanics, but those are fast and easy XP that should get you to level 5 in pretty much minutes. Now on the way you'll likely run into some very basic low level robots or creatures so you may want to try out the new real time VAT, which is very similar to the Fallout 4 version except, you know, in real time. This means that next to previous iterations of VAT, this version can actually be a lot less useful when you're getting swarmed by a large number of fast moving melee enemies. In previous iterations, when time was stopped or slowed down of course, it gave you a moment to pause, figure out what was going on and plan your next move. When it's all in real time, the percentages are flicking up and down too quickly as enemies dart in and out of your effective VATs range, so it's just too hard to read and it's not very useful. At the other extreme, meanwhile, at very long range, it initially yields a very low chance to hit. But if you're engaging enemies at medium range, it works just fine, and it does boost your critical meter. Criticals work almost exactly like they did in Fallout 4. You manually activate them, and then the next time you fire will be a critical hit. Now, in the early game, you'll be able to very easily handle everything without VATs if you wish, but having that critical ready in reserve for emergencies is a good idea, especially if you're planning to engage in PvP, when if you've got a critical ready and the other guy doesn't, that's certainly an advantage. Another very fun thing worth noting, by the way, is that melee VATS hits, as a tradition in Fallout, are either 0% chance to hit if you're out of range, or 95% chance to hit if you're in range. But that 95% triggers slightly further away than the weapon can actually hit if you're just to be swinging manually. This is because melee VATS in 76 comes with a little lunge forward built in, effectively providing a small blitz and helping melee characters close the gap with other players more easily. Very, very useful in PvP in particular, when it's likely that if you're a melee user, gun users will be backing away from you while firing, so closing that gap is crucial. Now by this point you'll definitely have leveled up because you're actually gifted your first level up within Vault 76 itself. So let's talk about this in a bit of detail because this is arguably the biggest overhaul to leveling and special and perks in the entire history of the franchise. So, a quick recap. Unlike every single other Fallout game, you start with a special of 1 across the board. When you level up, you increase any special attribute by 1 and that then is permanently boosted. You'll also pick a perk card. These perk cards have two requirements how much special commitment they require, so Gladiator's 1 in the top left means it needs a commitment of 1 strength, which you'll have by default, 
as well as potentially, but not always, a level requirement for your character. So for example, some cards can only be used once you hit level 5. So far nice and simple, but if you were to want to use another strength perk card that required one strength, or alternatively, if you wanted to pick Gladiator a second time, thereby upgrading it to a rank 2 Gladiator card, then you would now need two strength to continue using Gladiator. Or if it were two strength one cards, you could swap each one in and out as appropriate. The important thing to remember is that special is permanent and fixed, cards can now be swapped out at literally any time. Now as well as defining how many appropriate perk cards you're allowed to have equipped, most special stats do exactly what you'd expect if you've played Fallout 4. Strength affects carry capacity and melee damage, perception means better vats accuracy, all of that good stuff. There are however two major changes worth noting. Intelligence no longer boosts XP gain from all sources as it did in Fallout 4. Instead, with scrapping and crafting such a huge part of the game, it functions like a combination of the repair skill in Fallout 3 and the scrapper perk from Fallout 4. High intelligence characters craft better quality gear which lasts longer and get bonus components when they scrap, which you'll be doing a lot. I'll cover that later when we discuss crafting. Charisma, meanwhile, impacts perk sharing, and as charisma goes up, you can share more advanced perks with the rest of your party. You can see here, for example, that a level 4 character shared a basic level 1 first aid perk with me. Charisma also boosts the rewards that you get from any group quest, but I wasn't able to examine this in detail in my time with the game, so I can't really comment on how powerful that is. Now here's something that a few people who played the game early got confused by initially, so probably worth flagging. The special stat that you picked to boost each level does not force you to take a perk associated with that special. So for example, you can boost strength and then pick a perception card. Picking special first though does create the slightly odd scenario where you don't actually see the perk cards that are available that level until after you've already selected which special to boost, though you can actually go back by pressing B. So I'd recommend always checking what cards are going to be available before making a final decision about special, as you might choose to upgrade a card to level 2 or level 3, and that will always require more special commitment to continue using it. I actually made that exact mistake and upgraded my concentrated fire perk to level 2 without upgrading my perception, meaning I couldn't use it anymore until I leveled up again and boosted perception. The perk card packs that come every few levels will potentially throw some curveballs as well. Unlike the regular and fixed perks of normal leveling, perk card packs contain a random selection, so you can pick some really interesting stuff there which might encourage you to spec your character in a different direction from what you have been planning to. It's also possible to get duplicates out of perk card packs, or select duplicates of cards you've already selected when you're just leveling up normally. And both of those things are actually good because you need duplicates of cards to upgrade a card to its higher ranks. Finally, on the topic of the perk card packs, you might actually see a gold card. These have a gold back, their portraits animated, and they sparkle a bit. They're functionally identical to normal cards, they're just nice and pretty to have. One bit of advice on levelling up though, don't agonise too much about special at first. We've previously been told that you get to boost special every level up up to 50. So with your 7 starting points, that's 56 special points in total, more than any previous Fallout game. And of every perk card that's been seen so far, none has a special commitment higher than 3. Though I have seen a couple that look like they might ultimately do commitment of 4 or 5 at their highest level, such as Iron Fist. In short, a balanced character should be able to access every fully upgraded perk in the game as long as they're willing to commit a large part of their special capacity to that high rank card. So basically what I'm saying is nothing you can do in the early game will lock you out of anything later. As long as you've got a good idea where you want your character to ultimately go by the time you're say level 20, you should be absolutely fine. At low levels, therefore, feel free to experiment, but just in case you want a couple of ideas, here are a couple of good early game builds I put together. So let's start off with something I'm very, very glad about, which is the melee build actually seems not only workable, but actually pretty damn strong, especially in the early game. This is because the Gladiator perk, which boosts one hand of melee damage, is available immediately at level 2, and can be upgraded to Gladiator rank 2 straight afterwards. Plus, of course, if you're putting your special points into strength, that increases melee damage as well. Add in the blitz effect of melee vats that some players might not be expecting, and easily crafted melee weapons like the combat knife, and it's a strong early game strategy and surprisingly effective against other players, as guns lack similarly easy ways to boost damage in the early game. One player in the previous session I was at who invested everything into this sort of a build and just ran around with a big axe did very, very well in the PvP skirmishers. 
Another far more traditional Fallout option is to look into VATS and invest in perception and agility for accuracy and AP. You'll be wanting the concentrated fire perk card, available and upgradable almost immediately just like Gladiator, so that you can actually target body parts in VATS. By default you can't do that. And that perk card also awards bonus damage for concentrating fire on a single enemy's body parts. So it's actually one of very few ways to boost firearm damage in the early game, as are the crits that you'll have which manually aiming characters will lack. And this sort of direction will almost certainly sync very nicely with the luck based critical perks down the line, because this sort of build, high agility, high luck, crit heavy, was extremely strong in the mechanically very similar Fallout 4. Now a slightly more sideways take on character building would be for a single player to consider charisma. That's where the Lone Wanderer perk lives, which is absolutely essential for the Lone Player. But High Charisma also allows you to share advanced perks, which can be very useful in effectively bribing other players to let you join their team. Bethesda did actually confirm to me there will be proximity voice chat, mutable if you wish, of course. So being able to offer other players that if you join them, you can actually share an advanced high rank perk with them that they might not otherwise have, that's a nice little sweetener. Of course, you can just build a support character in general if you've already got a team you're planning to be part of. Of. Charisma perks include auto healing nearby team members when you heal, auto feeding nearby team members when you eat and drink, and various bonuses that you can receive when you revive a player, providing an incentive for these characters to fill the role of a medic. Anyway, let's move on to crafting, because while this looks superficially very similar to Fallout 4, it's also had a bit of an overhaul. You see, instead of just finding a base weapon and incrementally improving it with new parts, as in Fallout 4, this time we can craft weapons from scratch, and in terms of parts and modifications for weapons we've either just made or are found lying around, rather than taking ranks of a perk like Gun Nut or Science to learn about loads of components in one go, which meant I very, very often took Gun Nut 1 as my first perk in Fallout 4, you now break down duplicate weapons to slowly learn new and better quality components over time, though very advanced and exotic weapons and components are still locked behind intelligence perk cards, along with most of the explosive crafting. In the early game, you'll likely be breaking down a lot of pipe weapons and hunting rifles that seem to be very, very common, and a slightly upgraded pipe revolver and hunting rifle make an excellent early game pair of weapons. As I mentioned, if you've started boosting intelligence early, you'll be getting better quality stuff out of your scrapping at this point, potentially giving you an early game edge, as you can build the more advanced components more quickly, as you'll have more uncommon raw resources than other players, and this is where intelligence starts getting a little bit tempting, because you'll be doing a lot of gun scrapping, so pulling more precious precious screws out of each gun you scrap, yeah, that's useful. At the start of the game though, you won't actually be able to craft much from scratch, only very basic weapons. You'll be needing to find schematics or take the right perks for the more advanced things. As for armour with no raiders around to loot, you'll need to be making more of that yourself, which means things go a little bit Skyrim. You see, there's a lot more small animals in West Virginia than any previous Fallout, so hunting and skinning some foxes and similar in the first area to craft a full set of leather gear, especially a chest piece, is an excellent investment. That said, there is definitely some armour floating around in the game from slightly more unusual sources. I found the odd leather armour piece on animals, for example. But I should also flag that I tried to use the strategy of just looting armour as I found it, and by the time I hit level 7, I didn't actually have a chest piece at all. So crafting is definitely the smarter way to go there. While we're on the topic of crafting, like back in Fallout 3, weapons do have durability now. And actually, the total size of their condition meter is randomised for each weapon that you find in the wild, which is interesting, while high intelligence characters craft weapons with higher base durability. You'll be relieved to hear, however, that durability mostly doesn't need much attention. Unlike Fallout 3's weapons, which wore down very, very quickly, the weapons I used were still in decent condition after a lot of use. They're cheaply repaired at weapon workbenches, and various intelligence perks can reduce condition loss and make repair cheaper to do as well. Now, on to survival. Up to now, survival has always been an optional thing in Fallout, through New Vegas' hardcore option or Fallout 4 survival mode, so this might be new to some of you. Luckily, I really don't think you need to worry about survival too much. It's not very intrusive at all. There are only two meters, food and water, and both are very easily managed. 
For food, small, harmless and easily killable creatures are literally everywhere, and for water there are rivers and ponds all over. That does carry a risk of rads of course, but rad away seems absolutely plentiful in the enemy drops that I've seen, and high rads of course can now cause mutations, which can easily be powerful enough to accept the health loss of running around with high rads. Though it is worth noting that when you pick up a mutation, if you heal off the rads that cause that mutation to kick in, that will also remove the mutation until you've taken the starch genes perk card in the luck tree to lock in a preferred mutation even if you subsequently get rid of the rats. This to my mind makes endurance the special attribute you probably won't be interested in during the early game. The early perks in that tree are all about hunger, drinking and disease and that's just not a major issue at first. In fact I actually spotted at the end of my session that I had two diseases that I hadn't even realised I had. They just don't seem to be anywhere near as severe as Fallout 4 survival mode illnesses. Now moving on to the enemies, we've got less raiders these days and a lot more monsters. So that means there's a lot of melee enemies next to Fallout 4. This means that if you're mainly interested in PvE, mines are extremely useful, along with weapons with high range and accuracy, and in terms of tactics, positioning yourself inside or upstairs and then just guarding a staircase or door choke point, very, very solid idea. One new thing to look for, by the way, is boss enemies, marked with a little crown. These guys sometimes show up within a crowd of enemies, and when killed, drop a lot of varied loot. They seem to be kind of a replacement for Fallout 4's legendary creatures, which I didn't see in my time with the game at all. But unlike legendaries, they don't benefit from a second health bar or a mutated form. In fact, they don't actually seem to be any stronger than the rest of the group, and killing the boss has no impact on the effectiveness of its friends. They're just basically slightly angry, bitey Skyrim treasure chests, if you like. I would strongly recommend just throwing yourself into trouble, by the way, as death is an extremely mild inconvenience. If you run out of health, you'll fall to the ground and your team can revive you within 30 seconds with a stim pack to continue immediately, or if you're out of time or choose to respawn straight away, you'll just reappear nearby and the only thing you'll have lost is your junk. You keep all your weapons, all your armour and all of your progress. That junk is left in a little paper bag on the ground where you died, where you can just go and retrieve it if no one else has got there first, though your teammates can also grab it for you if they want. The only way to really lose anything is if you're killed in PvP and your attacker gets the bag after you expire. But even then, if it was a fair fight that you agreed to, he is on your map, so you can go after him to try and get it back if you want. One other basic to go over as well, the camp system, which is basically just a Fallout 4 settlement, except you can put it down anywhere. The only restriction being not too close to somebody else's camp. This just converts a circle of land around it to a settlement that you can fast travel back to for free anytime you want, and you can move it to you whenever you want for free as well. At first you can't build that much, just some basic wooden structures, but schematics are found out there all over the world and frequently given as quest rewards as well. Now, if you feel like getting out of the forest nice and quickly and just heading off to explore the different biomes, don't worry too much about high level enemies. A few levels higher is pretty much meaningless in this game. And at level 6, being totally swarmed by level 9 ghouls, say, isn't really a problem at all. If you're still in level 5 though, and you start running into enemies around level 15, which is what I started to see when I headed to the outskirts of the Central Mountain and Savage Divide region, then you're going to be needing some extra firepower. This is really what I think explosives are great at. They are just as ludicrously strong as they were in Fallout 4. They also seem a little bit more common as well. I had like 4 explosives before even leaving the starting area immediately outside the vault, and monsters will drop molotovs on a not a regular basis too. Even level 25 plus enemies are very manageable for extremely low level players, but at that point the stim pack usage will be very inefficient because you'll just have to be constantly spamming them, so you may want to level up or bring some friends along to help. On the topic of other people, fortunately the anti-griefing system seems to work really, really well and it makes it very safe to approach and potentially try to cooperate with neutral players in the overworld. You see, everybody is on the map so you can find neutrals easily enough. If they've previously been dicks to another player, they're marked in red so you can keep your distance. As while well, you can see them on your map, red murderer players cannot see you on theirs. Of course, you can actually use that to your advantage to hunt them down if you feel like it. Killing a murderer yields a bounty taken out of their own cap, which is just hilarious. Meanwhile, if the player you're approaching is just a neutral and the neutral tries to attack you, they do massively reduce damage until you accept the duel formally. And if you don't want to, you can fast travel away, block or mute them, or just turn your pacifist flag on, completely disabling PvP 
for you. As a result, it's safe to approach other neutral small teams or single players and maybe join up with them. Anyway, that's probably enough for now. That's just a quick overview of some of Fallout 76. Hopefully, that's answered a few questions, sparked a few ideas for the sort of character you might want to build, and naturally, I'll be digging into all of this a lot more when the beta begins. Maybe I'll even see some of you out there. But in the meantime, I've been Johnson. There's been many a true nerd, and this has just been a quick beginner's guide for Fallout 76. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Ah, we have got a gate key here, and then we have got a... I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake! This is going to take all of my skill and cunning as a hunter to sort out... Die, you moving bastards! Die! Die! Go, go away. Go away, nobody likes you. That was a good idea till it wasn't.